Please turn to Hebrews 4 if you're not there already. You will need your outline. Please open to the middle. <clears throat> you will see our points for today's message. <clears throat> we are on the second title there. It is titled, The Supersession of the Aaronic Priesthood by One Far Greater. The Supersession of the Aaronic Priesthood by One Far Greater. I'd like to get up uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 is our theme verse for this year. You all know if you've been with us for a while that the book of Hebrews <clears throat> is about Jesus being better, isn't it? Right. So we're continuing with that line of thought this afternoon, particularly making a comparison, sort of juxtaposing the priesthood of Aaron, the Old Testament Levitical Aaronic priesthood of, of Aaron, the high priest, and the as we will get into it here in time, the Melchizedekian priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The priesthood of Jesus is a far <coughs> superior priesthood to that Old Testament priesthood under uh, Aaron and the Levites. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, it says, For now he, this is the Lord Jesus, hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, a better ministry, a heavenly ministry at the right hand of God, as we'll see here in a minute, by how much also he is the mediator of a what? Better covenant, which was established upon what? Better prices, uh, or promises, prices. <laughs> the, the precious blood of Christ is the price by which you and I were purchased, obviously. But Christ is better. Christ is better. And I'm hoping you'll be able to see that. If you look at your outline, we made it through 1C, on our outline last week. I'll give you a second to find that. If you open your bulletin, it's the top point on the right. We will be working our way through that right side of the page, <clears throat> the right side of the page. And it is letter D. See where it says he's better than the Aaronic priesthood? Can everybody find that? Good. Okay. So we're going to start with verse 14, Hebrews 4, 14. Remember the apostle Paul is the one writing this letter. He's writing to his Jewish brethren. They're not only brethren by blood, biologically and hereditarily, but they are brethren in Christ. He's writing to Jews that were converted from Judaism that had come over to Christianity, been born again by the power of the gospel, and uh, which had produced faith in Jesus Christ. And, and Paul is writing to exhort them to do what? To continue, to continue in the faith. And, and not to uh, uh, fall short, as it were, as their Old Testament brethren did. They, many of them, when they heard the word that was preached in the Old Testament, did not hear that word in faith. And so if you're in chapter 4, I want you to see verse 14. And, and in fact, another underlying theme, if you want to write this down in the book of Hebrews, number one is that Jesus is better. But the, uh, the other sort of undercurrent through the book of Hebrews is the need to persevere. The need to persevere. Chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 6 and chapter 10 warn about the danger of apostasy. Starting in Christ or starting to follow Christ and then turning away at last and, per and falling away and utterly perishing. So he's... Exhorting them to continue. Remember the promise, uh, Matthew 24, 13. This is one you want to lay hold of. He that continues to the end, the same shall be what? Saved. That's Matthew 24, 13. That's, that's the same for you and I. Now you'll see it here in verse 14, chapter 4. Verse 14, as Paul is writing this letter to his Jewish brethren to continue in the grace of God. And he says in verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, not just a high priest, a great high priest. Some of the Jews might have been concerned that, hey, if I leave the old covenant, if I leave Judaism and I go to Christianity, where's my priest? Because remember, the highest office in the old covenant was the high priest. Did y'all know that? So when you leave Judaism to come over to Christianity, some of those Jews were concerned that they might not have a high priest to represent them like they did under the old covenant. And Paul's like, boy, let me tell you, you have a high priest in Christianity under the new covenant, but a far superior high priest, one who's way better than Aaron. We're going to talk about that here in a second. So he says we have a great high priest 
Here's one of the ways that he's better than Aaron. He's passed into the what? Heavens. Aaron didn't pass into the heavens to intercede for us. He only went in the tabernacle. And do you notice it says heavens plural? Because the Bible would teach us that there are three heavens. Heaven number one is the physical expanse where the sun and the moon and the stars are located. Even Genesis 1 says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's plural. There's heaven number one, the physical heavens that we see are are, are uh, when we study cosmology and, uh, and astronomy and all the planets and the billions of galaxies, our solar system, that's the first heaven. The second heaven has to be with that invisible spiritual sphere, that spiritual realm that's invisible where holy angels and demons are constantly engaged in spiritual warfare over the souls of men and women. Uh, uh, it's called the, uh, G uh, the devil is called the prince of the power of the what? The air. That term air is referring to the second heaven. And then there's a third heaven that Paul talked about. Second Corinthians chapter 12. You can look at that in your own time. Paul referred to himself in the third person as he described a man that entered into the third heaven, also called paradise. This is where Jesus ascended to the very blissful presence, being in the immediate presence of almighty God with the spirit and the holy angels. And if you trust Christ... This is where you're headed as well. This is where you're headed as well. Now it goes on to say here <clears throat> that he's passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God. Is Jesus the very son of God? Yes, he is. And he says, because of these things, watch this. Let us what? Hold fast. That means be strong. You want to write that down. Hold it firm. Hold it firm. Kratomen is the Greek term. Kratomen. The word kratos has to do with power or strength. Lay hold on the promises of God and lay hold on Christ and continue to lay hold on him. All of the distractions in this world and the influences of this world are designed to distract you from keeping your eyes on Jesus and continuing to lay hold on him as if there's something better out there for you. And there is not. Is that a true statement? There's nothing better out there. For us than Jesus Christ. And so he goes on to say here um, in the text, let us hold fast our profession. Continue in your profession. Continue believing. Continue following him. Now, 1D, I want to show you how this verse is showing that Jesus is better. Point 1D, Christ is better than the Aaronic priest. And I'm going to give you five or six different ways. I mentioned additional ones last week, but I'm going to give you some new ones today. Number one, <clears throat> Jesus is priesthood because that's what it's describing here because it says he's a high priest, right? Jesus is priesthood is superior to Aaron's number one because Jesus went into heaven. Do you guys believe that? Acts chapter one, verse nine, if I can get that up on the overhead. The Bible says that not only did Jesus resurrect from the grave on the third day, but after 40 days, he was seen of many witnesses. And then he ascended into the heavens as our a uh, 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 spiritual iron man who just flew off into heaven. You guys remember that? That's Acts chapter one. Look at it. Acts chapter one, verse nine, it says, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Verse 10, the disciples are seeing him after his resurrection here. And it says, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Who were they? Good, the angels and the appearance of men. They were really angels. Verse 11. This is what I want you to see here. And it says, which also said, this is what the angels said. You men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into what? Heaven. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into what? Heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He went into heaven on a cloud. When he comes back, he's coming out of heaven on a cloud in full blistering glory, isn't he? Right. So he's the resurrected, ascended, glorified son of God at the right hand of God. So he's superior to Aaron. Aaron, at best, went into the holy place in a physical building. Jesus entered into the very presence of God in heaven. Doesn't that make Jesus a better high priest? Yes. Number two, at Jesus' baptism, when Jesus came out the water, what did the father say to him from heaven? This is my beloved what? Son. 
That was that glorious, what we call in theology, the glorious annunciation. The glorious annunciation where the father declared the sonship of Jesus Christ. The father never did that for Aaron. Father never did that for Aaron. That's another area where Jesus is superior. He has eternal sonship with the father. Number three, the other way that Jesus has a superior priesthood to Aaron is that Jesus has what I call an authorized universal suckership. A universal suckership. Go back to chapter two, in case you're wondering, what in the world? <laughs> What's he mean by that? I took this right out of verse 18. Look at Hebrews chapter two, verse 18. It says, for in that he himself has suffered, that's Christ, being tempted, he is able to what? There it is. What does he mean by sucker? To help you or come to your aid. To help you or come to your aid. I'm sorry, Aaron's in heaven worshiping God, but he will not come to your aid. Did y'all know that? The believers in heaven are not looking down on you. You hear people say that at funerals. I know they're smiling, looking down. No, if they're believers, they're smiling and looking at Jesus. They're not looking at you. Why would they want to be focused on you? You and I, we're not all that. Christ is all that. They're, they're in a worship service if they're believers, right? They're not looking down on you, but Christ is. Aaron's not looking down on you, but Christ is. And he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Aaron is oblivious to your circumstances right now. The other thing is, do y'all remember? This is a good one. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus went into the wilderness, he was tempted how long? 40 days, Matthew 4, verses 1 and 11, tempted of the devil for 40 days. Did Jesus pass his test? Yes. And then remember, when Moses had to go up into the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God, how long was he in the mountain? 40 days. Read Exodus 24 through 28 in your own time. He was in there 40 days. And what was all the way to to chapter 32? In Exodus 32, during the 40-day testing, what was Aaron doing? Making an idol. Jesus passed his 40-day test. Aaron failed his. Do you see how superior Jesus' priesthood is? Is that making a little bit of sense? Right. Here's another one. The Lord Jesus Christ, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 3, was made in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, yet he had no sin. He became a a real man. It was a real man, just like Aaron. Jesus was made in the likeness of men, but without any of the sin that Aaron was born with or committed. Does that make sense? So one high priest, Aaron, was a sinner. The other high priest, Jesus, is sinless. Which one do you want to confess your sins to? Well, with that same logic, that means you should never be confessing your sins to another sinner in a booth. Because there's only one priest and his name is Jesus Christ. There are no priests on earth. All have sinned and come short of your glory. Therefore, it would be vain and foolish to confess our sins to another sinner. Why wouldn't you confess your sins to the sinless one who came to pay for your sins? See how he's better than Aaron? Look, for that what the law cannot do and that it was weak through the flesh. In other words, you and I in our flesh are unable to keep the demands of of the law. You can't do it. Because of the weakness of our flesh and sin. Because of that, God's sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Implies he had no sin. In the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh by dying for it. By being nailed to Calvary's tree to pay for our sins. That was the only way we could be saved. It was the only way we could be saved. And lastly, here's another comparison. This is the sixth one if you're keeping, keeping track. Jesus Christ died for our sins. Aaron died for his own sins. That's good, isn't it? Christ died for your sins, but Aaron had to die for his own sins. Remember, he couldn't enter into the promised land because of his sin, right? That's right. But Christ had no sin. He's a greater, greater high priest, isn't he? All right, so let's continue. Go to 1E on your outline. He's better then the Aaronic priesthood is letter D. Now, E is what I want you to see. It says he rules, Jesus rules with what and what? Power and pity. I'm hoping you can see these here. We're back in Hebrews 4. Listen to our verses. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Verse 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. See that there? 
So he's stating it in the negative, and he actually uses a double negative here to emphasize the reality. We have not, that's one negative, a high priest which cannot, second negative, be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Why does he use that? To emphasize the fact that he can be touched with our infirmities. Moreover, the word, this King James says touched. Touched with? The, the word they're touched with means to sympathize with. Your newer translations might say sympathize. It comes from two Greek words, soon, soon, which means with, and pathos, feeling. It means to feel with. Or to have a fellow feeling, it's the ability or <clears throat> the capacity to be able to commiserate with another person. And the reason he's able to do that is became, because he became one of us, yet without sin. He became a real man in order to save real sinners. Isn't that true? But it also says he was tempted. Look at the text here. That's why he can relate with us. Look, it says he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points what? You want to write down tried. The term tested there refers to him being tried, going through the process of trial, being tested, being tried. And what we said is, that, is the, the similarity and the difference between you and I being tested and Christ being tested. This is important. Theologically, you need to get this because when we engage with people, we often meet people that would deny the deity of Jesus or that would deny the uh, a likeness of Christ to us when he became uh, a, a human as as those that would doubt his real humanity in his incarnation. There's all sorts of battles that we have to fight. That's why we uh, went through Christology and and uh, um, we'll get to pneumatology, uh, uh, paterology in our systematic theology theology, so many different uh, 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 lessons for us to learn so we can be more equipped, not only to communicate the truth, but to defend the faith. Don't you want to defend the faith? Don't you love God? And don't you want to defend his honor? Most Christians can care less. Most Christians can care less. I pray that that's not anyone in the room. When you, when you love God, you want to stand for God. But in order to do that, you got to know what his word says, right? So when we talk about Christ being tested uh, or tempted, the King James says tempted, listen, he was tempted externally, but he was not tempted internally. You got to get that. That's important to get. I'll say it again. It, while we put up, and I, I might have given you the verse last week, but John 14, 30, if we can get that up on the overhead. I'll say it again. Jesus was tempted externally, but not internally. Do you understand the difference? He was tempted. In other words, he uh, was exposed to all sorts of temptations and trials. Our first daddy, Adam, had to be exposed to three major temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus faced those same ones in the wilderness when Satan came to him, turned the stones in the bread, lust of the flesh, go to the top of the temple and jump down and the angels will catch you. That's the pride of life. He took him up into a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Bow down to me. I'll give you all these things. Lust of the eyes. He was tempted with all three, but tempted externally, but not internally. He was not tempted internally, listen, listen, because he did not have a sin nature. There was nothing internally that Satan could get a hold of by which he could cause our master to fall. Now, you and I got a sin nature. You and I need help every day. We need the grace of God. We need the whole armor of God. We need to be reading the word, meditating in the word, encourage, having other brothers and sisters pray for us, and God to keep his hand on us, don't we? All right. Yeah, hereafter, Jesus says to the disciples, I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world. Who is that? Satan comes and he has nothing in me. There's no sin nature and no propensity to sin by which he can cause me to, to sin or stumble or fall. OK, so that's important. But he was tempted. He was a real man exposed to all the tests and trials that we are. And in his real humanity, he faced it all and passed every test with flying colors. That's why we're going to heaven because of the obedience of Jesus. So I want you to write down two words. Christ is authorized. Well, it's a little bit more than that. <laughs> Christ is authorized to realize and sympathize. Christ is authorized to realize and sympathize. Did everybody get that? He's authorized to realize and sympathize. 
He's been authorized, placed at the right hand of God because Christ in his humanity uh, experimentally realized what it was like to be a human being with the infirmities of human flesh. And therefore, he is able to and qualify to sympathize with us. He knows what we're going through. In fact, he knows it even more so. Because he went through the whole test. You and I stumbled and failed during the test, didn't we? But he went through the whole test and passed the whole thing. So he's able to help us, encourage us, and counsel us. So let me tell you what makes Jesus unique. Jesus is a unique king. Jesus is a unique king priest. He's a unique leader. Because most of our political leaders today, once in office, tend to be sort of aloof and distant from what common citizens on the ground are dealing with. And they often fail to really sympathize with our plight. But contrarily, you and I have a savior and a king who is in heaven on his throne who actually cares for us. And it's not a deistic deity. Christ is not a deistic deity. Y'all know what deism means? This is important, too. As the theological battles increase, as we get closer to the return of Jesus, you need to understand these terms. So deism is the belief system that there is a creator that created all things, but it's not involved in any of them. Deism, I'll say it again, is the belief that there is a creator that created all things, but sort of steps back and doesn't get involved in any of them. That is not describing the biblical God at all. God, because he loves us, is all up in our business all the time. Didn't he say, I promise never to leave you nor forsake you, right? And the Bible says in Jeremiah 23 that God feels all things, heaven and earth. The earth or the heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Right. And he's with his people and where? In his people. And the, doesn't the Bible say God is working all things after the counsel of his own will? Doesn't that blow up deistic ideology totally out of the water? Yes, it does. God's in control of all things. So Jesus then can be understood, listen, as a very present help in time of need. Jesus is a very present help in time of need. Christ, because he loves us, will never leave us alone. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Isn't that what he said in John 14? Yeah, that's right. So <clears throat> this isn't a sort of deistic deity who creates all things and then fails to intervene or care. But Jesus is intimately concerned and active in our lives, helping us, guiding us. Leading us, protecting us, providing for us, keeping us, as well as commiserating with us in everything that we go through. Is that a true statement? He knows, he feels, and he cares. He knows, he feels, and he cares. Can y'all get those three? He knows, and he feels, and he cares. And the thing that makes Jesus different than all other earthly political leaders is Jesus uses his power to help us, not oppress us. To help us, not oppress us. And how does Jesus rule? With two Ps, power and pity. Power and pity. I want to show you a really beautiful example in the scriptures. Turn with me to Genesis 41, please. Genesis chapter 41. While you are turning there, can I get up Mark 140 on the overhead? <clears throat> I want to show you two overhead verses. And what are we considering here? Jesus, as our high priest, he's at the right hand of God, operating in two Ps, power and what? And pity, okay? Jesus operated on earth in power and pity, and he also operates in heaven at the right hand of God in power and pity, too. Watch these two verses. This is Jesus at the beginning of his uh, public ministry and he's on the backside of a mountain and a leper a man that was full of leprosy uh, Luke 5 says he was full of leprosy and he comes to Jesus leprosy was incredibly contagious in those days if you saw a leper in those days you, you would take off running because it would kill you and there was no cure for it <clears throat> but Jesus had a cure for it it says in Mark uh, 140 <clears throat> and there came a leper to him beseeching him and kneeling down to him and said unto him if you will, you can make me clean. Whose will here will affect the healing and, and the salvation? 
Not the, not the man's will, Jesus' will. The same will that's required to be exercised in order for you to be saved. You're not saved by exercising your will. You're saved by Jesus exercising his will. Right? It's not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that showeth mercy. Okay? That's Romans 9, 15 and 16. All right. Jesus, he says to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. He's totally dependent on, on Jesus' will. Verse 41. Jesus Moved with compassion, okay? That comes from the Greek term splachnon. It means to be moved in your bowels. In Jewish thought, the, the bowels was the seat of pity and compassion and mercy. In Jewish thought, your heart was not here. It was here. And he was moved in his bowels toward this man. Like he's moved in his bowels toward needy sinners who cry out to him. Cry out to him and he'll have mercy on you. He promises to. Look, it says, move with compassion. Jesus put forth his hand. He's not afraid to touch him. That's awesome, isn't it? He put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. Whose will saves? Jesus' will. Y'all see that there? Is he showing pity and compassion here? Yeah. Now, uh, Mark 16, verse 19 and 20, you're going to see his power. But again, it's still mixed with pity and care for his people because he's not going to leave us alone. He knows that you and I have a work to do that we can't get done on our own. So listen, even when Jesus went to heaven, he still didn't leave us alone. Look at Mark 16, uh, 19. Look, this is after his resurrection. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up where? Into heaven and sat where? That's power. He is in his session at the right hand of God. All power in heaven and earth is placed in his hands. Verse 20. <clears throat> and then it says, and they went forth. The disciples went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. I thought he went to heaven. He did. But it says he's working with them. He is. He's in both places at the same time. He's still not leaving them to themselves. He cares about their mission. And he's empowering them by his spirit to help them get the job done. He's doing the same thing with us who believe the gospel. Let this comfort you. The, the task that you and I have to evangelize and see lost sinners saved, listen, is an insurmountable task. It's like moving a mountain. When Jesus was talking to the disciples about moving mountains, he wasn't talking literally. He was talking figuratively and allegorically because when sinners are saved, mountains of sin are moved by the blood of Christ washed away and cast into the sea isn't that good right but we don't have to do it on our own we have christ empowering us to do it look they went forth preaching everywhere the lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following amen so even the miracles that they were doing to corroborate and to affirm their messages that was christ empowering them to do that he didn't leave them alone power and pity all right you guys in genesis 41 all right we're in Genesis 41. Brother Joseph uh, was sold back in chapter 37 and 38 by his brothers. First, he was thrown into a pit, right? And his jealous brothers, J J Joseph should have kept that dream to himself, huh? All right, all y'all going to be making obeisance to me and bowing down to me. And they're like, okay, little brother, we're going to find out. And in their jealousy, they threw him in a pit. And then after that, they sold him to the Ishmaelites. And he ended up going down into Egypt and ended up... <clears throat> Being in Potiphar's house. You guys know the account. Um, but then we turn around and all of a sudden Joseph is on the throne, right? God is sovereign. So if you look at verse 53, Genesis 41, 53. And I want you to see the connection with our text in Hebrews. Because as we work our way through here, if you're careful, if the spirit of God blesses you. Listen, you should be able to see the high priesthood of Jesus in the life of Joseph. Watch this. You guys in chapter 41. Let's start at verse Fifth, I guess I'll start about verse uh, 53. <clears throat> it says, And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Remember in his dream, he dreamed of seven years of plenty and seven years of what? Famine, right? Well, the seven years of plenty ended. And now the famine's coming. But they laid up because of Joseph's dream. He knew it was coming. Now watch when it says, verse 54, And the seven years of dearth, that's, that dearth means famine. The seven years of famine begin to come. According as Joseph had said, and all the dearth was in all lands. That's all over the world. But in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, that term famished here means hungry, hungry. Okay. 
when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Who's the Pharaoh? The king, right? They all went to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh sent unto all the Egyptians, go unto Joseph. What he says to you, do it. Y'all see the gospel there? Pharaoh there represents God the Father. Joseph there represents God the Son. Jesus is the only way to the Father. You can't go directly to the Father other than going through your heavenly Joseph. Raise your hand if you saw the gospel there. That's the gospel. Jesus is the one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. No one can come to God apart from Jesus Christ. Y'all see it? They came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like, uh-uh, what y'all doing? All right, that's my translation. Uh-uh, what y'all doing? You better, go, you better go to the second in command. You better go to Joseph. If you're going to get to God, you've got to go through Christ. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Isn't that right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the heavenly Pharaoh but by me. Isn't that right? All right. And then he says here, go to Joseph. And what he says to you, what? Because Jesus is Lord. Because Jesus is Lord. Now I want you to see the gospel here too. The word famished in verse 55 means hungry. Don't you and I live in a worldwide dearth? Stay with me. Stay with me. We live in a worldwide dearth, don't we? There's a famine in the land. This is what the prophet Amos prophesied of in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. He said, there's a famine in the land, not of bread and of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord, hearing the word of God. This is the, the time period that we live in now. I've told you all this before. <clears throat> when the Lord first saved me, I heard the gospel. I started asking because all those years in church, I went to church and I didn't hear the gospel. You can go to church all your life and not, not know the gospel. There's a lot of people that are like that. When I heard the gospel, I, I didn't hear the gospel in church. First time I heard it in the gym. The Lord knows how to find you. <laughs> and I said, where do they preach this at? I never heard this in church before. And they told me two places. And I ended up eventually driving about an hour and 50 minutes to go to church. For people that would complain about having to drive 15, 20 minutes. An hour 45 to 50 minutes one way to go to the Bay Area. Because God was teaching me experimentally that the true preaching of the gospel is rare. It's rare. And the question is, how hungry are you for the truth? It can't just be about convenience. Can't just be about convenience. Not if your soul is precious to you. Not if you're, you're serious about making it to heaven. Right. You go a little bit. You'll drive a little bit for, further to go to a good, good automobile place. Good car shop. You won't just go to the closest one to your house. Not if they ain't all. How many stars they got? <laughs> right. Right. How many stars? They only got two stars. The one on the other side of town got five. I'm going there. They tear my car up. Isn't that right? And you want work done in your house. You're going to check reviews and you're going to find the best place. Even if you have to pay a little bit more or go a little bit further. But when it comes to the most important thing in the world, our eternity bound soul and sound expository Christocentric Bible preaching. We can kind of take it or leave it to go to a place that might be a little bit closer. Come on, we need to be more serious about our souls. More serious about our souls. Don't settle for anything less than sound doctrine. No matter how far you got to drive. All right. So there's a famine all over the land. And then it says, he says, go to Joseph. These are hungry people. You got to go to Joseph. Verse 56. And the famine was all over the face of the earth. See it? And Joseph opened all the what? Storehouses. What was in the storehouses? I want you to write it down. The storehouses represent gospel churches. That's good. They represent gospel churches. Joseph is over the storehouses. Jesus is Lord over his churches. And sound gospel preaching churches have the bread of Christ where you can feed on it and be saved. Are you hungry for Christ? Are you hungry for eternal life? You will find a sound gospel storehouse to go to then. Joseph opened all the storehouses. Christ has to open the church. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. And what the Bible says? And sold unto the Egyptians. Y'all see the gospel there? Right. The gospel is being sold. And we receive it. We purchase it by what commodity? Faith. In that Isaiah chapter 55. You pay for it by faith. Without money. By faith. And it says. And they sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. Verse 57. And all the countries came into Egypt to who? Joseph. 
Now, so all the world, as it were, is being drawn to Egypt and being drawn to one man. What's his name? Joseph. Remember, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto who? So Joseph here really points to who? Jesus. Remember, Joseph already died. Metaphorically, he was already in the pit. Christ went into the pit for us when he died and was buried in the prison house of the grave. Did Joseph go to prison? He's already been resurrected and ascended to the right hand of God. All power in heaven and earth is in his hands. Do you see Jesus in Joseph? I do. I do. I do. He came out of the pit, came out of prison like Christ came out of the grave. Now all power in heaven and earth is in his hands. Jesus is our heavenly Joseph. Y'all see the gospel there? I do. Okay, go to chapter 50. Chapter 50. So he's in command, but he's also an inter, like a high priest, as it were, an intermediary between the people and, and Pharaoh. Jesus is the intermediary between us and God. That's right. Now go to chapter 15. Now we see his power, but I want you to see his pity because his brothers now fast forward down the line. Their daddy dies. Jacob dies, right? They're like, oh, no, Joseph, he's going he, he gonna to kill us now because daddy's not here to protect us. They thought they were going to die. They thought their past would come back on them like some of you do. Some of you do. Some of you are going through trials right now and you think, God's getting me. Don't raise your hand. But some of you think like that. I want you to know that that's not biblical. God is not getting you. He got Christ for you. He punished Christ for you. God is not punishing you. He punished your Savior in your place so he would never have to punish you. He's working with you. He's humbling you. He's, he's pruning you. He's correcting you. He's chasing you. But boy, be thankful he's not punishing you because you would never come out of that. Christ was punished for you, okay? Just want you to hope that helps somebody. Okay, chapter uh, 50, verse 15, then we'll get back. Verse 15, watch the pity of our Savior. It says, and when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, oh, Joseph, peradventure will hate us, and he will certainly requite us. He's going to pay us back for all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, uh, your father did command before he died, saying, so shall you say unto Joseph, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of your brethren. See that? And their sin, for they did unto thee, uh, did unto the evil. You know, you say, hey, hey, Joseph, remember, daddy said you got to forgive us. Daddy says you can't kill us. Right. So I want you to see something beautiful here, too. They're appealing to the father's will. But the son always came to do the father's will. There's a misnomer in, in some Bible teaching that somehow Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, came and died in order to change God's mind. That God really didn't want to save us, but Jesus wanted to save us. And he pleaded and pleaded. And when he died, he changed God's mind and made God willing to save us. That is not the gospel. It was the father that sent the son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Our redemption started in the father. It started with the father who chose us in Christ before the world began. The father always wanted us. And so did the Son and the Holy Spirit. But Jesus had to pay a price. He had to put our sins away because God is holy and he must punish sin. Okay? So I'm hoping that helps. It's the Father's desire that Christ would forgive us and save us. Okay? And so it says, uh, uh, a trespass of their brethren and their sin, for they did unto the evil. And now, watch, since we pray thee, forgive the trespass of your servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept. When they spake unto him, doesn't he remind us of our Savior who could be touched with the feelings of our infirmities? Do you see it there? Right. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we be your servants. That's the right thing to say, huh? Aren't we the servants of Christ? That's right. Jesus is our master. And Joseph said unto them, don't fear, for am I in the place of God? Right. He was only a man. Right. So he's a type of Christ. But Jesus, who's greater than Joseph, actually is in the place not only of man, but also of God, because Christ is God. Verse 20 is what I want you to see. And he says, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. See it? That's good. To bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. I want you to write down the word theodicy. This has to do with the doctrine of the Odyssey. Okay, Dissi has to do with righteousness. Righteousness, 
and theos is what? God. So it deals with the existence of evil while there is a good God. Why would a good or how could a good God allow evil? That's what the Odyssey uh, deals with. The Christian should be able to deal with that. Okay, so the Bible will say things like this. Okay, and, and if Bible believing Christians, we don't run from doctrine. We deal with it. Isaiah 45, 7. God says, I form the light and I create darkness. I make peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Proverbs 16, 4. Proverbs 16, 4 says, the Lord has created all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil. Okay. The wrath of man shall praise the Lord and the remainder of wrath shall thou restrain. Psalm 76, 10. I can go on and on. OK, so this is this is how it works. This is how it works. God is sovereign over evil. OK, God in his eternal decree before the foundation of the world purposed that evil would come into the world. God has no evil in himself. God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. But God in his own sovereign and good purposes decreed and declared that evil would come into the world and God would govern it. God would manage it and God would use that evil for good. You see in the text, God allowed his brothers and God's permissive will. We've talked about the five wills of God here at, at Way of Grace. There are five wills of God. One of those is the permissive will of God, the permissive will of God, that God will allow evils to happen in this world because he has a greater purpose in order to fulfill his redemptive will, even though it goes against his preceptive will. It's a part of his decretive will. OK, and it's in line with his secret will. Those are the five wills of God. And so even though man means to do harm and evil, God is able to take that evil, turn it around and bring greater good out of it. God is even more glorified by Adam and Eve sinning and falling in the garden um, and then him coming into the world in the person of Jesus Christ and saving them and saving all mankind through faith in Jesus Christ. He's more glorified through redeeming fallen men than had men never fallen in the first place. And it doesn't have to make sense to you and I. It only has to make sense to God. And I'll, I'll give you one reason. I love that God don't go through the uh, Bible apologize and I'm sorry this don't make sense to you. I'm sorry that don't make sense to you. He, who, who, are, who are we? We're, we're, we're the clay. He's the potter. The, the clay don't tell the potter what to do. Right? God does what he wants to do and he doesn't ask for permission. And everything he does is right. But through the redeeming work from Jesus Christ, God is even more glorified than had there never been a fall. Because through Jesus going to Calvary's tree, there are attributes and characteristics of God revealed throughout the universe that would not have been revealed had there not been a fall. Through the fall and redemption of men, God is revealed as a God of mercy, as a God of grace, as a God of forgiveness. Without sin and the fall, you would never even have a need for those things. As a long-suffering God, a patient, kind God, a redeeming God that loves to save sinners. Also a holy God who has a pure and righteous wrath. See why you need a cross? It's at the cross where all of those attributes converge on one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was necessary that there be a fall and that there be a subsequent redemption by a God of salvation. He's more glorified that way than had we never fallen in the first place. That's why Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 talks about us singing to God about the redemption that we experience. Had that not happened, we'd have no song to sing in heaven. That's good. That's good. We wouldn't have nothing to sing down here either. All the songs that we sing here are either explicitly or implicitly talking about God's redemption. Without it, what will we sing? Does that make sense? Right, we're praising God for saving us. All right, so I'm hoping that makes sense. <clears throat> he says, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. He took evil and brought good out of it. God's the best in the business at doing that. And to bring to pass, as it is this day, listen, to save much people alive. God, listen, God used the evil of Joseph's 11 brothers to save people all over the world. God used the evil of Judas to save billions and billions of people. Do you all understand what I'm saying? Right. What the devil meant for evil, God purposed and used for good. All right, let's go back to our text. Let's go to point number two. Hebrews chapter four. <clears throat> 
The Bible in, in Hebrews chapter 4 tells you and I to be bold. You guys back in Hebrews uh, 4? Notice when it says here in verse 16. It says, let us therefore come what? Boldly unto the throne of grace. That term boldly there does not mean arrogant. Okay, it's not arrogance. It's confidence. It's not arrogance. The word there means confident or freedom of speech. Come boldly to the throne. Come confidently. I told us this before. The word confidence in the English language comes from the Latin confideo. Con means with. Fideo means faith. And deo means God. True confidence is rooted in faith in God. Faith in God. Faith in God. A person that does not have faith in God has a false confidence. The true believer has a real confidence, but our confidence is not in ourselves. It's in Christ. Does that make sense? All right. Look at letter A. The one who is there for us cares for us. Isn't that good? The one who's there for us cares for us. Can I get up 1 Peter 5, 7? 1 Peter 5, 7 on the overhead. And while he's putting that up, let's stay in verse 16. Look at what it says here. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's a promise there that the Lord Jesus Christ will give grace and mercy and help to those who need it. There's a promise. there. Look what it says here. Casting all your what? Care upon him for he what? See that first word care. I want you to write down the word anxiety. That's what it means. Anxiety. Write that down. Cast all your anxieties on him. That's what it means. Yep. This is going to hurt what I'm getting ready to say. Just, just a little bit. Cast all your worries and anxieties upon him. What a witness you and I have to the truth when everything around us in this world, in society, in the culture is falling apart. And here you have rest and you have peace and you have confidence when everything is falling apart and you're not worried at all. What a witness that is. What a witness that what an opportunity it is for people to see you trusting Jesus when everybody around you is filled with worry and fear and anxiety and concern about everything under the sun. And they look at you and you have perfect peace. That's a witnessing opportunity to cause people to say, why are, why are you so restful? Why are you so peaceful? Why, why are you so confident? Not arrogant, confident. How can you be, at, uh, be so still and be so, uh, be so uh, tranquil when everything around you is falling apart? Then you can tell them because I'm standing on a rock. I'm standing on a rock and I shall not be moved. My God is with me and promises never to leave me nor forsake me. Though heaven and earth shall fall away, my words will not pass away. Isn't that what the master says? What a witnessing opportunity. What a witnessing opportunity. But what a witness you do not have. What a witness you do not have when you're filled with fear. What a witness you lose. What a stumbling block. What a, what a hindrance to the gospel you are to other people when they might be looking at you and seeking to know the way to salvation when they watch your life, but you're filled, of, filled with fear and worry and trepidation and anxiety and concerns. They're going to back up off you. They're going to back up. They're going to say, where's your God at that you talk about? I see you with your Bible going to church every week, but you always worried, always filled with anxiety. Is your God even real? See what I'm saying? Where is your God at? See what I'm saying? And, and we, 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 we destroy a perfect witnessing opportunity. Do you even believe in that God? That God you say you know. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. We can do a lot of good or we can do a lot of bad. In fact, it's a sin to be filled with worry, the Bible says. Listen, when you're filled with worry, listen to me, listen to me. D don't deflect what I'm saying, because you know how you can listen. To I like that part. I like, I'm, he got to miss me with that. I like that. I might do that. I ain't listening to that. That's what some people do. I know you do. I, I, when I say you, I'm saying it editorially, just generally. That's how some people listen to messages. They deflect the parts that they don't like. Don't deflect God. Don't deflect his word. He's talking to you. It's not just a man up here. It's not just a man up here. You got to deal with him. Pay attention to what he's saying. When you're filled with fear and anxiety and worry, what you're saying is your situation is bigger than God. 
That's what you're saying. God, this situation is so big, you can't handle it. That's idolatry. You're making a God out of your situation when you do that. I'm just letting you know. You've gone on to worship another God when you're gripped with anxiety and fear all the time. You got at least two gods now. Right? Yep. God's a jealous God. I'm just telling you what his word says. Okay, you guys in chapter 13? <clears throat> chapter 13, look, what, look at verse 5 and 6. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Lord, help us there. And be content. Lord, help us there. America's in big trouble. We're, we're an extremely covetous nation, very ungrateful, very unthankful. We are more blessed, and in, in our, our nation's got a lot of problems, but we're still the most blessed nation in the world. But we are filled with the most unthankful, ungrateful people. Ungrateful. Lord, help us. Ungrateful. Help us. <clears throat> All right, he says here, be content with such things as you have. Be thankful. And he says, for he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So shouldn't we act like we really believe that verse just like a little bit, just a little bit? Verse six, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not what? I will not what? I will not fear what man shall do unto me. God is with me. God is sovereign. God's in control. God's bigger than that man. God's bigger than this situation. God's bigger than my problems, isn't he? Right. So I can trust him. I don't need to be filled and gripped with fear. We dishonor God when we do that. And as you go back to our text, chapter 4, because we only have a little bit of time left. This is going to be a test for you and I in the months and the years to come when the persecution begins to increase. And they start forcing them brain chips in your head. And they start encroaching and smashing you down in smart cities where you can't travel further than 15 miles. I'm not laughing. I told you all where to go to and look it up. You can see I'm not making this up. When they start t stealing your children from your home because you don't affirm their transgender thoughts. They want to take your children. When they start taking our Bibles from us, they will be taking our Bibles from us. They're already doing it electronically, going in and altering electronic Bibles. See, that's why you got to have a real Bible with you just in case. Because one of these times you're going to be following me and I'm going to be reading from here and you're going to be reading from here. Say, that don't match up. Pastor told you. Pastor told you, you better have a real Bible with you, too. And then when they take that, then you got to have it in here. You got to have it in your heart because it's coming. And then when the next pandemic comes, the next pandemic comes and they're going to tell you to get out of your church. What are you going to do then? Are you going to stand for the truth? Are you going to stand on a rock, which is Jesus Christ? Are you going to stand bold and firm in the truth and continue to obey the word of Christ, regardless of what the culture and the government says to you then? See how quiet it got? See what I'm saying? Yep. Yep. See, these, this is the battle that we, we're going to have to face. But Christ will be with you. Take a deep breath. Christ will be with you. Stand. But he will be with you. He will be with you. He's not going to leave you by yourself. You don't have to do it on your own. He will be with us. All right, 2B. We've got to hurry up. Christ's blood speaks. Aaron's blood don't speak. Y'all know that, right? That's another, another way Jesus is better. Christ's blood speaks. It says some things. Okay. Your outline says his blood speaks peace. And says what? Come. Did y'all know Jesus' blood speaks? Go to chapter 12. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 12. If you're in Hebrews chapter 12... <clears throat> yeah, look at verse 24. It's going to take us a while before we get here. But it says, verse 24, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, right? Everybody see that term there? We've been covering uh, covenant theology uh, on Tuesdays. So the mediator of the covenant there refers to Jesus satisfying all the conditions of the old covenant. And by his righteous life and death and resurrection, he establishes a new covenant, the covenant of grace. Did everybody get that? Okay. And all of that was a part of the covenant of redemption. The Trinitarian covenant made between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit from the foundation of the world. 
whereby the Father sent the Son, and the Son agreed to come and be the surety and die in the sinner's place to bear the wrath of God and take all their sins upon himself and pay the full payment for them by his sufferings and the shedding of his blood at the cross and then raise again for their justification, go back to heaven and send the third person who would come and be applying that work of Jesus to the hearts of sinners, okay? That's the covenant of redemption. But Christ had to fulfill the conditions of the covenant of works in order to establish forever the covenant of grace. All those things together work according to one overarching covenant, the everlasting covenant. Y'all get that? You can listen to the message again and you can come back and you can listen to that part a couple of times so you can get it. But Christ did all those things and therefore he's the mediator of the new covenant. And it says, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, listen, and to the blood, the blood of sprinkling, that's Jesus' blood, that speaks See it? That speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood cried out punishment, punishment and justice. Christ's blood screams mercy, forgiveness, pardon. Let them go. That's what Christ's blood screams and the father hears it. Okay. The other thing I love about our Savior here, go back to chapter 4, is he's approachable. Most political leaders today are not approachable. They got secret service and everything, right? You can walk right up on Jesus. When he was here, you could walk right up on him, couldn't you? Christ was accessible, interruptible, and approachable. Christ was accessible, interruptible, and approachable in his earthly ministry. And he's still approachable now by faith through prayer. By faith, through prayer, you have access to the king of glory. And listen, it's a two-way communication. Ready? We talk to Jesus by, no, we talk to him by prayer, and he talks back. He sends us a text message called the word. You get it? This is text message to us. God likes to text. OK, it's a two way communication. You cut off your communication with God when you cut one of those off. Some people read, don't spend any time in prayer. Some people spend a bunch of time in prayer and don't read and don't come under the preaching of the gospel. You're cutting off God's communication with you. It's a two way communication. OK, it's very important. OK, prayer, us to him, reading him to us. OK, hope that makes sense. We've got to keep going. We're almost out of time. Go to 2C. <clears throat> Please go to letter 2C. Um, your 2C should say he is able to assist, help, and strengthen us. Does it say that? He is able to assist, help, and strengthen us. That's verse 16 again. We're almost done. Verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the verse here is, is, is telling you and I that we have a faithful high priest who's at the right hand of God. It tells us, come, come confidently unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy. He will, he will be merciful to us. And if we come to him, we will find grace to help in time of need. When we're in need, if we call on Christ, he will show up. He will meet our need. So you and I have a resurrected high priest that hears us and, listen, promises to answer our prayers. Did y'all know that? Did you know Jesus answers prayer? John 14, 13. Let's get that up on the overhead real quick. This is a verse you can use to affirm the deity of Christ. People say, oh, well, Jesus is just... Really? Okay. We're not saying he's less than a man, but he's more. He's a man plus more. He's the God man, right? Well, how do we deal with this then? It says, <clears throat> Jesus says this here. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Ask in his name. It, it, so we're, we're, that's prayer. Jesus saying, I'll do it. Jesus saying, I'm going to answer the prayer. How is Jesus able to answer prayer? But he's not God. S somebody please help me. Right? Somebody please help me. If Jesus is answering prayer, then he's God. It's only God is answering prayer. Mary cannot answer prayer. Angels can't answer prayer. Dead saints can't answer prayer. The Aaron and the Aaronic priesthood cannot answer prayer. Christ answers prayer. That's right. And that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And the Father is glorified when the Son does it. That is so good. That is so good. 
So this, is, uh, uh, this reality is designed to encourage you and I to hold fast our profession. This is what we saw back in verse 14. Hold fast. Continue in Christ. How come? Because he loves you. How come? Because he atoned for you. How come? Because he's raised again at the right hand of God, advocating for you and interceding for you, encouraging you to come to his throne. And he will be with you. And he's advocating for you successfully. Successfully. We know that because the father raised him again. That's right. Now, here's the battle that you and I are in. Go back to verse 14. We only got two letters left. All right, go back to verse 14. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That's a struggle today. It's a struggle today. Hold it firm, hold it sure. Why is that a battle today? Because we live in the postmodern era. Today, in 2024, we live in what's called a postmodern era. What's a postmodern era? A very um, relativistic era where everyone has their own truth in a relativistic way. And postmodernism is the ideology, listen, that there's no such thing as absolute objective truth. Postmodernism is the ideology that there's no such thing as absolute objective truth. So when we come telling people, I know the truth, they think we're crazy, right? When you tell people, I know that Jesus is the only, if you say Jesus is a way, they'll give you high fives and pat you on the back. And, oh, you cool, Jesus, yeah, he cool. And, and the Dalai Lama's cool and, and, and Hinduism is cool and, 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 and all these other religions. So everybody's got their own way and nobody steps on anybody's toe. Everybody's cool. But when you say, no, Jesus is the only way and all them other ways are liars. Now you got to fight on your hands. Right. Right. And, 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 and so you and I, are, if we're confident in Christ, we're confident that he really is the way, the truth and the life. And no man can come unto the father but by him. And people say, you mean Jesus is the only way and all these other established religions are wrong? That's what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. I had to tell some people that last week. That's exactly what I'm saying. He's the only way. But when you say that, they're going to say you're arrogant. They're going to accuse you of dogmatism. They're going to say you're too narrow-minded. You need to open up your mind. Child of God, the worst thing you can do is open up your mind to a lie. It's a blessed virtue to be biblically narrow-minded. I'll tell you one reason why it's good and healthy for you to be narrow-minded. Because if you're too open-minded, your brain will fall out. You have to be narrow-minded if there's only one way to salvation. Isn't it Acts 4.12? Y'all know your Bible? Acts 4.12? Can we put that up? Acts 4.12. The apostle Peter said there's no other name given under heaven among men by which you and I must be saved. Y'all see that there? Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way, one name, one mediator between God and men, singular, the man, Christ Jesus. Every other way is going to lead to hell. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of, there you go. There you go. Let them call you cuckoo and, and biased and bigoted and prejudiced and narrow-minded on you, all you want, on your way to heaven, on your way to heaven, okay? Yep. But a good witness, though, let, let me tell you this, your persuasion of the truth while today it may be offending people, tomorrow it might be used to convince them. When you witness to people, if, if you go out, like we got a, a, we call it a sauna ministry at the gym. We, we go in the gym, me and the brother. We got half a way of grace brothers in the gym now working out. That's good. We going to take care of, of our temples, right? But then we're looking for opportunities to witness when we're in there too. And we're in the sauna. And then yesterday we were in the steam room, almost died of that thing. It was like 200 degrees in there. We're in there talking about Jesus. We got to talking. To, I don't remember that guy's name. He knows who I'm talking about. Um, but we got to share. We got to talk to him for a little bit about Jesus. Some of your other brothers are at different gyms witnessing to people. Right. We want to spread the gospel everywhere we go. We want people to know the grace of God everywhere we go. Whatever our area, wherever our, our, our sphere of influence is, where God has strategically, providentially placed us. We are there on purpose to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. 
So be intentional about it. Look for opportunities, right? We got more cards for y'all to be passing out to. Y'all should be passing out cards. We already got other things in the works too that we're talking about. But that's good for us though. But let them call you what, what, what they want. But when you witness to people, if you witness in a way that seems unsure, when you share the gospel with people, they can sense whether or not you really believe it or not. And you're talking to them about the only way to salvation, but you say it in a way by which you, you're filled with incredulity and doubt as to whether you believe it or not too. Why should they believe it? Does that make sense? And, and it helps the message uh, uh, be even more believable in the minds of those that you're sharing with it when they see how much you believe it. It's important that you actually believe the message that you're sharing with other people. In fact, this is why a lot of Christians don't talk to other people about it because they don't really believe it themselves. That's a big part of the reason why people don't share it with other people. It's not that they're concerned about it coming out right. All of us are flawed. All of us are flawed. It's never going to come out perfectly. It only came out of Christ's mouth perfectly. Uh, but it doesn't have to come out perfect to save because we're not the ones that do the saving. God does the saving. Right. Well, I only know a little bit. Share the little bit you know. God's able to use the little bit that you know. All they have to have is faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. God can work with that. He can work with that. But the problem with a lot of people, the reason they don't share Christ is, is a lot of times they don't believe. They don't believe it's really sad. So ask the Lord to increase your faith. Amen. I want to give you a few reasons as we begin to wrap up why you and I can be so sure. You can write them down. You don't have to write them. It's up to you. But why you and I can be so confident and so bold, confident and sure and certain about the truth. Well, number one is because the Bible is a historically reliable document. It's a historically reliable document. The Bible has hundreds of fulfilled prophecies from the Old Testament, hundreds of them. How could the Old Testament writers have known what was going to happen hundreds or even thousands of years in the future? And it happened precisely just as they said. The Bible has stood for centuries against scrutiny, attacks and examination from all sorts of critics. And it stood the test of time. You and I can trust it. Here's another reason. Jesus quoted it. Jesus quoted the Bible and Jesus never sinned. Shouldn't we believe him? And he never quoted any other book. The Bible has more manuscript copies than any other book in human history. The Bible has more manuscript copies to prove its veracity and its authenticity. More copies than any other book in human history. No other book even comes close. The Bible is the best-selling nonfiction book in human history, over 5 billion copies. Best-selling nonfiction book in human history, over 5 billion copies. And the, the Bible has changed my life and saved me. And all of you are walking testimonies of it. Those of you that have been born again, that shows that the book is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Isn't that right? It's a living book. It proves it by converting souls. And it's the only book that convinces of sin, but also shows the remedy for sin. No other book can do that. Those are pretty good examples. All right, two more letters so we can, we can take the table, go eat and get out of here. Two others. Go to point T, uh, point D. Be thankful you don't have a point T. <laughs> One day. All right, he's on our side. See it right there? He's on our side. Does everybody have a point there? All right, Jesus Christ is on your side. Um, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Jesus Christ is on your side, right? Yeah. Go to Romans chapter 8. I want you to see verse 32. This is why you, you and I can be confident. Jesus Christ is on your side if you're a believer. If you're a believer. Look at verse 32. Uh, verse 31, I'm sorry. It says, what shall we then say to these things if God be what? For us. Who can be against us? Who can successfully be against us if God is for us? But if you're not a believer, then the opposite is true. If God be against you, who can be for you? No one. This is why we need Christ. God is only for you in Christ. Look at the next verse. He that spared not his own son 
but delivered him up for us all. That's all believers, all who trust him. He delivered him up in your place. Up where? Delivered him up where? At Calvary's cross. And how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Paul is arguing from the greater to the lesser. If he gave up his son for you and gave you the most precious thing, the apple of his eye, the most important person to him, if he gave you the greater, won't he give you the lesser? Won't he meet your daily needs, give you food, clothing, and shelter, and give you everything you need for life and godliness? The answer is yes. And then he says, verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of who? So the us here in the preceding verses is referring to God's elect. Those that God chose in Christ before the foundation of the world. And it says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. There is no charge, no transgression, no sin that your neighbor, your enemy, or even Satan can bring against you on that day if Christ died for you. Isn't that good news? Right. And then it says here, who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died. That's why God can pardon you, because there was another person that paid your debt. Christ died. Yea, rather, that is what? Risen again. That's his resurrection. Who is even at the right hand of God? That's his ascension. Who also makes intercession for us. So if God has done all those things for us. Is there any condemnation that can come against us? Or any charge that can remove us from a state of justification? Not possible. Not possible. Not possible. It's, it's a wonderful reality for us to be in believers. God is on our side. And believers are on God's side if we're in Christ. Okay. Now I want to show you something back in our text. I was going to show you something else. But I'm going to condense this. Please go back to Hebrews. Because we do have to take the table. There's a beautiful word here that I need you to see before we go. It's back in Hebrews 4 in our last verse. We will not go into chapter 5 today. Our last verse of Hebrews 4. Look at verse 16. Listen, believers, it says here, Let us therefore come boldly, right, come confidently, unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy. Anybody here need mercy? I do. And find grace find grace the term find there refers to that which is obtained after much seeking first that which is obtained or procured after much seeking this is rooted in the faithfulness of god because he says if you seek me you will what find me when you seek me how with all of your heart right does that show the faithfulness of God? He promises if you seek him in truth, sincerely, you will find him because he'll make himself known. And, and notice this, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want you to see the word mercy here, that we may obtain mercy and find grace. The word mercy here is a very, very unique word. The word mercy here is also connected with God's faithfulness. Now, the word, it means uh, pity or compassion, all those kind of things, right? But it's interesting. The word that's used here, uh, mercy, is our Greek word, elios. Elios. And it's the New Testament equivalent to our Hebrew word, kased. Kased. In the Old Testament, can we get up Exodus 34, 6? I'll be real brief on this. Sometimes you'll see the word kasad or kased in the Old Testament translated loving kindness, right? You've seen the term loving kindness in the Old Testament. And then the word uh, kased here, is tra it's translated goodness, I believe, in the King James. Yeah, it says, and the Lord passed by before him. This is Jesus who came to Moses. And it says he proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in kased. Kased. That word here, kasad or kased, is the New Testament equivalent. Actually, the, the Greek translation for that word is the word that we see here in our text for mercy. So I want you to write it down. What is the word here? It means covenant loyalty. Covenant loyalty. Covenant love. Covenant love. So the reason why the believer can be confident that you'll receive mercy and grace when you come to Christ, is that because in the eternal covenant, even before the world began, the son in his covenant obligated himself to meet our needs. 
He obligated himself not only to save us, but to seal us, to protect us, and ultimately to redeem us and bring us safe to heaven. He obligated himself in the covenant to do those things. So his love to us is based on covenant. His love to us and his mercy to us is based on covenant. Which also means that love is not unconditional. I know we use that term. We talk about, oh, I love such and such unconditionally. No, you don't. You love them conditionally. There's no such thing as unconditional love. We love him because he what? That's a condition. That's a condition. That's a condition. Right? Because. And the Bible says the love of God is in Christ. Romans 8, 39. If you are the object of love, it's going to be because you're in Christ. That's a condition. God has mercy on you because of Christ. When we pray, we say, God, hear me for Christ's sake. That's covenant. I go on and on. Right. It's so because the covenant is irrevocable and immutable and everlasting, Christ will never stop loving his people. Because it's an everlasting covenant. God is immutable. His promises are immutable. Therefore, his love is immutable to his people. Therefore, a true believer can never go to hell. Did that help somebody? A, a true believer can never perish. We saw the verse earlier. Faithful is he who has called you who will also do it. Isn't that right? That's right. All right. So let's go to our last letter. 2E. We'll close here. This is real simple. I'm going to read verse 16 for the last time. and We'll close with this thought. Here it is. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace. Come confidently to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. So it promises that if we do, we'll obtain mercy and we'll find grace to help in time of need. Right. How is it? Here's my closing question for you. How is it that you and I can come to the throne of grace confidently? Well, it's because of point to eat. It's because it's not a throne of merit. It's a throne of mercy. It's not a throne of merit. It's a throne of mercy and grace. Okay? So in other words, your confidence is not in yourself. Can we put up Philippians 3.3? 3? We'll close with this. Your confidence is not in yourself. Your, your confidence is not in what you did or how good you are, how many works you did, or what you didn't do, or your comparative righteousness by which you compare yourself to other people. Right. Because we can do that, too. That's a trap. There are people that think they're going to heaven because they're not as bad as their neighbor, but they're still bad. <laughs> they're still sinners. You committed one sin. You're under the wrath of God. You need Jesus. Right. And Jesus can take care of that one sin or a billion sins. But you need Christ. So so there is another reason to come confidently, not confident in yourself. Look at this verse here. Close right here. It says that you and I are the circumcision. See it. That means we're Jews. I see that we're Jews, spiritual Jews. The term circumcision refers to Jews. We've all been circumcised. If you're a believer in your heart, when God gave you a new heart, that's the circumcision. OK, we're all we are the circumcision, which worship God in the what? The Holy Spirit that works in us. And we rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in our flesh. We don't have confidence in our bloodline. We don't have confidence in our skin color. You're not closer to God because you're black or white, or you're not further from God because you're black or white or any other ethnic group. And we're surely not trusting in Jewish pedigree or heritage. The only blood we trust in is the blood of Jesus. That's right. And have no confidence in the flesh. Have no confidence in yourself, your goodness, your works, or anything you've done in your flesh. Confidence is not to be found there. Your confidence is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only trusting in the blood of Christ. I'm sorry. Can I put one more verse up there? I'm sorry. Okay. See, I need salvation too. I see. All right. Please forgive me. Isaiah 55 verse 6. Then we'll stop right here. I got another one. I'm not going to it. We're going to end with this one. See, I'm put. I'm, we done. I just want you to see it. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Okay. Watch what it says. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. That implies that there's a time when he will not be found. Don't listen to people say, you can come to the Lord anytime you want. That's not what that says. It says that come to him while today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not promised. Your next breath is not promised. 
Call on him now. Call on him now by faith from your heart. Lord, save me. All right? All right. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, and call ye upon him while he's near, implying he won't always be near. Verse 7. He says, come and call, come and call, come and call. And then he says, watch this promise he makes. Let the wicked, that's all of us, forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts, that's all of us too. And let him return unto the Lord. Watch this promise. And he will have mercy upon him. That's a promise. We need to start getting the bread and the wine. We need to start getting the bread and the wine, okay? He will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Is that good news? Past sins, present sins, future sins, all sins. If you turn from them and put your trust in the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who already paid the sin debt, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. All right, we'll stop there. God bless you.